Now on the screen is the test of the Soviet Tsar bomb on October 30, 1961. They were declassified by Rosatom just a couple of years ago. This is the most powerful thermonuclear explosion in history. Then the tests were carried out for a psychological effect to scare the United States, an opponent of the Cold War. Now Vladimir Putin is in charge of the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, inherited by Russia from the USSR, and it seems he's not shy about using nuclear blackmail either. I want to remind you that our country also has various means of destruction. This is not a bluff. But what if it really isn't a bluff? In June of the 23rd year, US President Joseph Biden said that the threat of Putin's use of tactical nuclear weapons is real. He also called Putin's decision to move nuclear warheads to Belarus extremely irresponsible. We have already received bombs and missiles from Russia. He didn't leave. Slowly. For this video, we tried to find out if Russia could really start a nuclear war. We also tried to figure out how nuclear weapons work, what they are capable of, and who possesses them now. By the way, before you start, you can support our work if you subscribe to the channel. And you can also support us through sponsorship on YouTube. This is very important for us, as the Russian authorities recently recognized Novaya Gazeta Europa as an undesirable organization. Enjoy watching. A small disclaimer. There is a lot of theory in the video so if you are interested in some specific topic related to nuclear weapons, then do not hesitate to use time codes. We left them in the description. But first, let's figure out how nuclear weapons work in general. We warn you right away that this is a very simplified description. Everything is made up of atoms, and every atom has a nucleus. It was discovered by the British physicist Ernest Rutherford in 1911. This is one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science, which led to the appearance of nuclear weapons. But we are a little ahead of ourselves. The nucleus of an atom is 10,000 times smaller than the atom itself. It's about like one grain of sand in such a mountain of sand. The nucleus itself consists of protons. They have a positive electric charge, and neutrons they have no electric charge. Particles with the same electric charges are repelled, but the stability of atomic nuclei nevertheless is ensured by the strong interaction between protons and neutrons. The number of protons is called the charge of the nucleus. The sum of the number of protons and neutrons is called the atomic number. The nuclei of the same chemical element, by definition, have the same charge but may have a different atomic number due to the different number of neutrons. The nuclei of the same chemical element with different atomic numbers are called its isotopes. So, the charge of the uranium nucleus is 92, and the most common isotopes of uranium in nature have atomic numbers 238 and 235. There is a shell of electrons around the nucleus in which the charge is negative. There are the same number of protons and electrons in an atom, so in general the atom is neutral. Some atomic nuclei are unstable, they tend to disintegrate. Nuclei can emit alpha particles. These are the nuclei of helium atoms, beta particles are electrons. Gamma rays are called high-energy photons and other particles. The nucleus may fall apart into two large pieces and several neutrons. This phenomenon is called spontaneous fission. Nuclei can also absorb a neutron and in response fall apart into two large pieces and two or three neutrons. This process is called forced nuclear fission. If these neutrons hit the nuclei of neighboring atoms, they will also disintegrate, and several neutrons will fly out of each again when such a process increases. It is said that a chain nuclear fission reaction is triggered. This process was reproduced by the Italian-born American physicist Erka Fermi, in 1942 in the world's first nuclear reactor it is also used in nuclear weapons hiroshima used the simplest way to create such a reaction in practice moreover american scientists and the military were so confident of success that they launched a baby bomb on the japanese city without any preliminary tests at all i think you know how it ended the bombing of hiroshima claimed the lives of 146,000 people in the kid 
One piece of uranium with a Massachusetts less than critical was used. A piece with a Massachusetts greater than the critical Massachusetts will immediately melt or explode. This piece was inserted into the cannon as a projectile with a charge of gunpowder at one end, and a uranium target was placed at the other end. And to make an explosion, they fired from this cannon. It worked because when these two pieces of uranium collided, their combined Massachusetts became more critical. That's when the nuclear chain reaction started. But there is a nuance. These two pieces had to be directed at each other so quickly that the reaction did not have time to start before the final collision. Such a cannon-type bomb used in Hiroshima is possible only if uranium is used. It contained about 60 kilograms of uranium, enriched by 80%, that is, 80% is uranium-235, capable of supporting a chain nuclear reaction. In 1941, the Nobel Prize-winning scientist Glenn Seaborg synthesized plutonium-239. He got it from uranium. This helped scientists from the Manhattan Project led by the father of the nuclear bomb, Robert Oppenheimer, to create a new type of nuclear weapon. In this type of weapon, implosion is used instead of cannon technology. This is when a sphere of plutonium is compressed by synchronous explosions from all sides. How sharply its Massachusetts becomes more critical and a nuclear explosion occurs. This is how the main part of modern nuclear weapons works. In modern thermonuclear weapons, an atom fission reaction is used together with a fusion reaction. Synthesis enormously increases the power of the explosion. Implosive bombs require less material. The bomb dropped on Nagasaki contained only about 6 kilograms of plutonium. Up to 80,000 people died in Nagasaki. And what are kilotons? This is a unit of measurement of the power of the explosion. For clarity, it is considered to be the power in CT equivalent. That is, the power of a nuclear explosion is measured in how much CT is needed to recreate the same explosion. A one kiloton explosion looks like this. The power of the smallest tactical nuclear warhead is up to one kiloton in CT equivalent. The largest ones can be up to a hundred kilotons in power. This will be the radius of defeat if it is dropped on Moscow and blown up in the air over the city center. Note that this is just an example for clarity. A nuclear bombing of Moscow or any other city would be a terrible tragedy that humanity should avoid in every possible way. But it seems that not everyone agrees with this. In total, our submarines are capable of releasing more than half a thousand nuclear warheads, which are guaranteed to destroy the United States and all NATO missiles in addition. An attempt to turn the territories of the United States or another NATO country into nuclear ashes will almost certainly lead to mutual destruction and a catastrophe that will affect the entire planet. It seems that Russian propaganda does not quite understand this. A small area within the radius of the green circle will be infected with a lethal dose of radiation. The yellow circle is the maximum radius of a nuclear fireball it will destroy the entire Kremlin and Red Square. The gray circle is a zone in which almost all large buildings will be destroyed. Fires will start and there will be a lot of victims. Windows and buildings will be broken. Many people will suffer. Those who will watch the explosion will get eye burns. And finally, the largest circle, thermal radioactive radiation will spread in it. People outside shelters will receive burns of varying severity. And here's what happens if you drop the Tsar bomb. Within the radius of the green circle, the entire area will be infected with a lethal dose of radiation. This time, the face center of Moscow will get into the yellow circle. Almost everything will evaporate inside it. A gray circle, it will affect Kimki, Maitishchi, and Lyubertsi. This is a zone in which almost all large buildings will be destroyed. Fires will start, and there will be a lot of victims. In the gray circle, more windows will be broken in buildings. Many people will suffer. Those who will watch the explosion will get eye burns. Even Najinsk falls into the largest circle. Thermal radioactive radiation will spread to this point. People outside the shelters will get burns of varying severity. How does tactical nuclear weapons differ from strategic ones? Tactical nuclear weapons are small nuclear charges plus delivery vehicles. It is used on the battlefield or for a limited nuclear strike. Its task is to destroy targets in a certain area 
but in such a way as to avoid radioactive contamination on a large scale. Strategic nuclear weapons are weapons with much greater power, up to a thousand kilotons, and it can be used at longer distances, at a distance of thousands of thousands of kilometers. It is believed that strategic weapons will be used last. What is a dirty bomb? A dirty bomb differs from conventional nuclear weapons in that its main damaging factor is the scattering of radioactive waste by means of an explosion and not the explosion itself. It is believed that it is technically very difficult to create because the radiation in such a bomb is dangerous for everyone who will work closely with it. Radiation can also break the electronics needed to create a bomb and this further complicates the whole process. Chemical weapons do about the same thing but easier. Because of this, experts note that a dirty bomb in its purest form is more of a horror story. On the one hand, this is a horror story, and on the other hand, a dirty bomb. To understand a dirty bomb exists, and in principle, a dirty bomb can be made quite easily. There won't be a nuclear explosion, so it won't be a nuclear one. It will be a dirty radiation bomb. Radiation will get into the ground. There is water somewhere. Water will pick up this radiation. It's all the action of a dirty bomb, that's about it. But this is not a nuclear explosion, and not what we call a nuclear floor. From the point of view of the military, yes, from the point of view of military defeat, it does nothing. There is no big sense, because the meaning of a yes in my mind is a powerful explosion, a powerful wave, a powerful temperature is high and so on. And to use this dirty bomb, but there is no sense in military terms. In some kind of terrorist plan, yes. However, in theory, it is possible to use an explosion at a nuclear power plant to create a similar effect. Because of this, the news about the Zaporozhye NPP is of particular concern. The president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, said that his country's intelligence had recorded signs of mining the roof of the Zaporozhye NPP. But what can the Russian military achieve with this? Undoubtedly, there is a sharp. If they start shooting there, or the bombing starts, if they destroy, then there will be a dirty territory. How many dirty territories will there be? This is also a good question, because it is not known how much they will destroy. It is not known what the weather will be. It is not known where the wind will blow. It is not known how this nuclear fuel will be scattered. There will not be, for example, the same effect as in Chernobyl, because in Chernobyl there was a completely different physics of that explosion. There will be no such explosion here. The Russian side, conducting a strict policy with regard to this station, they do not seem to really hope that this station will be operated by the Russian side sometime. And now they're using her as blackmail. You see, here we have a station, we have nuclear and radioactive materials at this station. If you suddenly, then if anything, we will either blow up here ourselves, or with your help we will blow up. And you will be here then for a very long time to clean up the traditional pollution that you will get as a result of all this. Russia's nuclear arsenal. Russia has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. According to the CPRI, as of January 2023, the Russian Federation has 5,889 warheads in its arsenal. This is slightly less than half of all existing warheads in the world. Only the USA has similar indicators. The Americans keep 5,244 warheads in various forms. If we add to them, the warheads of NATO countries, then the total figure will approach the Russian one. The figures are of course approximate. Moreover, after the outbreak of war with Ukraine, Russia suspended its participation in international treaties on the control of nuclear weapons. There are nine countries that have nuclear weapons. 90% of the world's nuclear arsenal is controlled by Russia and the United States. And moreover, if you think about the amount of destruction that each specific bomb can cause, then Russia and the United States own more than 90% of the global explosive power. So, these two countries have thousands of nuclear weapons. In other countries, no more than a few hundred. And maybe it will change sometime. We see that countries like China are beginning to gradually increase their arsenals. And you know, it is quite possible that they will increase their stocks. But at the moment, 
the leaders are in this, USA and Russia. Also, Russia and the United States are the only countries that have a so-called nuclear triad. The nuclear triad is the ability to use nuclear warheads in three ways. Through strategic bombers from the air, with the help of nuclear submarines in the water, and in intercontinental ballistic missiles from the ground, their flight range is more than five and a half thousand kilometers. This video shows a training launch of a hypersonic Zircon rocket. In theory, this rocket is capable of reaching any target in the world. Some hypersonic missiles can reach speeds up to five times the speed of sound. Because of this, they are very difficult to detect and shoot down. At the same time, Russia's new military doctrine, signed by Putin, allows the use of nuclear weapons in the event of an existential threat to the country. What exactly this means, in fact, only one person knows. It seems to me that with the end of the Cold War, the world has never been so close to a nuclear conflict. We see that many countries that have nuclear weapons are in open conflict with other states. Or, they have such security protocols in which, in the event of a threat to one country, its allies enter into a military conflict with the threatening state. There are a lot of such triangles now, and this scares me, because, even if a nuclear conflict starts in one part of the Earth, it will spread to other territories very quickly. This is not at all the situation that was during the Cold War. Will Putin use nuclear weapons? In order to use nuclear weapons, Putin will need to enlist the support of Defense Minister Shoig and Chief of the General Staff of the Russian Armed Forces Gerasimov, as well as enlist the support of the 12th Main Directorate of the Russian Defense Ministry. It is responsible for nuclear security and safety. On February 28th, Putin brought the nuclear deterrent forces into a special regime. At the same time, the Pentagon said at the time, that they had no evidence that the Russian Federation was preparing to use nuclear weapons. I think he understands that the use of nuclear weapons crosses all possible lines and gives zero advantage in terms of its goals. I hope that we will not see the use of nuclear weapons during this war. But I am confused by the factor of misunderstanding and randomness in this war. Therefore, although it does not seem to me that Russia will consciously use nuclear weapons, I can easily imagine how it uses it because of some accident or misunderstanding. You can easily get into a dangerous situation when you are forced to act in conditions of limited information, where the leaders of countries cannot communicate with each other. That's what scares me. However, some experts note that the failures of the Russian army in Ukraine and the growing tensions around the figure of Vladimir Putin significantly increase the risks. It is impossible to completely exclude the use of at least tactical weapons in the war in Ukraine. It is also worrying that Russia has announced the transfer of part of its tactical nuclear warheads to Belarus. Russia is deploying nuclear weapons in Belarus, Iskanderem complexes. However, experts from the Federation of American Scientists claim that there is no evidence that tactical warheads have already fallen to Lukashenko. It is quite possible that we are missing something. Maybe nuclear weapons were brought to Belarus in some other way, or they are going to do it in some other way. But based on what we know about how nuclear weapons are likely to be transferred to Belarus, we have not yet seen clear indications on satellite images that this has happened. And you know, we are looking at these statements from Lukashenko, from Putin, and we're just not ready to say for sure yet that this is definitely true. It's possible that they announced these plans to signal something else. Perhaps to complement the world that Russia has nuclear weapons, it is possible that it will not be able to use them. Tactical nuclear weapons are potentially vulnerable on the territory of Belarus as they are close to the borders of NATO. If you put them there, you won't be able to protect them properly. And, I don't think it's in Russia's interests to make its nuclear weapons very vulnerable to a potential attack. This should definitely be a signal for NATO, for Ukraine, for the United States.
This is a kind of reminder, Russia has nuclear weapons. They are not afraid to move them, potentially bluffing, threatening its use. In 2000, some of the scientists who participated in 1983 in modeling the initial scenario of a nuclear winter, investigated the likely results of a theoretical regional nuclear war between India and Pakistan. They considered the option of such a war with the use of only 100 Hiroshima-level nuclear warheads, with a total capacity of only one and a half megatons, which does not exceed the capacity of some individual warheads in the arsenals of the United States and Russia. To their shock, they found out that since these weapons would inevitably be aimed at cities full of combustible materials, the resulting fire tornadoes would emit a huge amount of black smoke from the upper atmosphere, which would spread throughout the world and cause the earth to cool down so long and strong that it would lead to a worldwide collapse of agriculture. According to Alan Robach and Owen Brian Thune, 20 million people will die immediately from the shock wave of fire and radiation, and another billion over the next months from Massachusetts starvation, and all this as a result of a local one and a half megaton nuclear war. But how will the global nuclear conflict develop with the fascination of Russia's arsenals from the United States? These are known locations of nuclear weapons storage facilities on the territory of Russia. They are dispersed all over the country. The map was published by researcher Pavel Podvik. The red dots on it are known locations of strategic nuclear weapons. In theory, they are capable of hitting targets at a distance of more than 9,000 kilometers. This is a doomsday weapon that will be used in the most horrific possible scenarios. A blow from the Russian Topolem can lead to an explosion with a capacity of 300 to 800 kilotons. This is enough to destroy any major city on the planet, but NATO is unlikely to stand in the country if Russia uses these weapons. We do not know exactly how such a conflict will develop, but scientists from the Future Offline Institute have prepared a simulation of a possible global nuclear war. When one of the countries launches nuclear missiles, the other side will immediately detect it and carry out a retaliatory strike. Major cities will be attacked, firstly, because important military facilities are located there, and secondly, the restoration of an enemy country after the war depends on their infrastructure. Powerful nuclear explosions will literally vaporize people close to the epicenter. A little further, there will be strong fires, people will be blinded. The shock wave will destroy the building standing in its way. But explosions, electromagnetic pulses and radiation are not the worst thing that will arise as a result of a nuclear war. The worst thing is a nuclear winter. It will lead to black carbon smoke generated by bomb explosions. Because of the firestorm, black clouds are filling the stratosphere. They will rise above the usual clouds, which in another situation could wash them away. In just a few days, black smoke will cover the sky over most of the northern hemisphere. At this time, the earth will become very cold, even in the summer, temperatures will drop by 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. A recent study says that up to 5 billion people will die from hunger in this situation, including about 99% of people in the United States, Europe, Russia and China. Thank you for watching this video to the end. I hope it seemed useful to you. Subscribe to our channel and support us through sponsorship on YouTube if you are not in Russia.